Fatalism. The belief that all events are predetermined and therefore inevitable. This is one of the key elements of film noir. Men trapped by the will of fate and spat out the other end, left to walk the earth a zombie or sleep with the mackerel. Edgar G. Ulmer knew it. Destined to be a B-movie director who would only get recognition after death. Al Roberts also knew it. And there was no way of getting out of it once his life took a detour. To all you out of work soda jerks without a penny to pinch. To the detectives with all the answers. To the dastardly dames who play men like baby dolls. And the trusted ones too pure for this world. And all you double crossing, backstabbing, ruthless, baby faced amateurs. This one's for you. So suit up, turn out the lights, put the match to your smokes, and sit back for the darker side of things. Cine Shadow Moonlights, Noir Vimbo. The film opens with a man walking down a dark road all alone at night. He's disheveled, unshaven, dirty, very unwelcoming, short-tempered. He gets into a spat with a guy at the diner bar. He looks like he's ready to die. The man plays a song on the jukebox and this awakens his anger. Then we get into the inter-dialogue, the voice over narration. The camera is right on his face in a close-up. The light only on his eyes, kind of like Dracula. We find out his story. We find out that it's a man by the name of Al. He's a piano player in a smoky club, the Break of Dawn Club. He's dating one of the singers there, Sue. They're in love with each other. But there's something that he just doesn't feel that is right. That fatalism again. She says, oh, you'll be a big piano player one day. He says, someday, yeah, someday, if I don't get arthritis first. There's a shot when Al and Sue leave the Break of Dawn Club. Smoke, fog, and darkness hide the set pieces from their cheapness. Sue soon travels to L.A. to start a career of her own. Al soon misses her. He becomes desperate. He longs for her. Nothing but her. Not even money. And he'll get to her by any means necessary. He says, I'll be there if I have to crawl. If I have to travel by pogo stick. His quotes are hilarious. He starts hitching rides to Cali. He's got no money. He's got nothing. Just his finger to go on. While he was traveling, I looked at his face and he looks a lot like Kurt Russell, which made me enjoy this film even more. He ends up hitching a ride with a man who gambles on horse races. He's a self-made man. He's of means. He's got a lot of dough. He's also got a deep scratch down his hand from a dame who he picked up. Al ends up being fed by this man when they stop off at a diner, but this man is getting tired, so he has Al drive him the rest of the way. And while that man's sleeping, Al dreams off into this great sequence. In this dream sequence, we get a close-up of the rearview mirror, and in it, we see Sue singing in Hollywood with large silhouettes of band musicians behind her. It's very eerie and surreal. It soon starts to rain and Al needs to put the top up. He pulls over on the side of the road to wake Mr. Haskell up so he can help him, but to no avail. He won't wake up. I mean, how's a guy just going to be sleeping through a rainstorm with heavy drops pouring on your head? It seems very unlikely. So he opens the door to move him, but when he does... Mr. Haskell falls out of the door, slamming his head on a rock. He's dead. I mean, how is that going to happen? Let alone, who's going to believe him that that's how that man died? This dirty grifter? Just the guy accidentally died? Like, oh, you didn't hit him on the head with a big rock? At least, this is how Al, Al thinks. So, he takes Mr. Haskell's body and dumps it in a ditch. An officer even pulls up next to him and questions Al after Al has hidden Mr. Haskell's body, but nothing comes of it. 
Fate has played a deadly hand. The drops streak down the windshield like tears. So now, Al needs to figure out what the hell he's gonna do. He's got a dead man's car, and he's definitely not that dead man. He needs to get rid of it as soon as he can. But he does the worst thing. He picks up a woman. And fate strikes again. It ends up being the same woman that had scratched Haskell's hand. She knows that Al is not Haskell, and now she wants in on this. Blackmail time. Wherever you turn, fate sticks out a foot to trip you. Her name's Vera, and she takes over with cunning and starts bossing Al around. She is not letting him out of her sight. From now on, you and I, we're like Siamese twins. She's a fast talker, and she decides to sell the car and keep all of the profit. Their interactions are funny together, especially when they're back at the hotel room. They're like an old married couple who love each other, but also kind of hate each other too. They remind me of my grandparents. My grandpa would be in there and he'd just yell, Donna! You know, something like, you left the water running in the sink and it's overflowing on the ground. You know, it's funny. When they go to sell the car, Vera sees something in the paper and she gets greedy, which is something you never do in the noir. It seems that Mr. Haskell's dad was a very well-off man and he's looking for his son. So I think maybe Al can dress like Haskell and get some of that money. But he's not going for it. He doesn't like that idea. But Vera, she's very persistent. It also seems that she's dying. She might have that, you know, that Camille disease. She's coughing all the time, drinking, boozing. The ending to this movie is something you can't believe. Like, really? This happened to this man again? He's got the worst luck. It reminds me of that Albert King song. Born under a bad sign. Bow, quow. So they're getting drunk. They're fighting about what the heck to do. And Vera ends up threatening to call the police. It gets hotter and it gets violent. She drunkenly runs with the phone into the bedroom and accidentally wraps the cord around her neck. Al is yelling at her through the other side of the door and he just wants to rip the phone cord out of the wall. But when he pulls the phone cord, he unsuspectingly chokes her to death. Vera is dead. Again, no one is going to believe this guy. To end, through all its budgetary shortcomings, this film is a fatalistic masterpiece. Edgar G. Ulmer is said to have shot it in six days. And that's an unbelievable feat. He was truly skilled. Those Europeans, man. The fate of Al Roberts is no joke. He's a walking dead man. Can't go to New York. Can't go to L.A. Left to walk the lonely streets between. Some say he's still out there.